What's an anaphylactic shock? Let's look at the name first, right? There's two parts to it. One is shock, and shock means that there's a circulatory medical emergency. The body fails to supply its tissue and its organs with enough blood, and most of the time that's due to a loss of blood volume and circulation, either because of strong bleeding or because the volume is bound up somewhere else. The most relevant symptom for this is a loss in blood pressure, and that's called hypotension. But oftentimes you'll also see other heart-related symptoms, like an irregular heartbeat, that's called dysrhythmia, while the heart is struggling to somehow supply more blood, but it can't. Later on, something like cardiac arrest might happen. Patients lose consciousness, and because cells and organs don't get enough oxygen and nutrients anymore, eventually they take irreversible damage and the patient dies. Now let's look at the first half of the name. Anaphylactic is a Greek word, and literally, if you look at it, it means anaphylactic against protection. Maybe you've come across the word prophylactic before, which is the opposite, it means for protection. So if you do something prophylactically, you do it such that your body is more resistant in the future, it's less sensitive. In anaphylaxis, it's the exact opposite. You've come into contact with something before, and now your body is more sensitive to it. So we have an allergic hypersensitivity. And in fact, most cases of anaphylactic shock do involve the same pathways as allergic asthma or hay fever. But there are also cases which do not involve those characteristic antibodies. And the immune symptoms can get triggered even by non-allergenes, like some drugs, exercise or temperature. Anaphylaxis is actually a rather broad set of inflammatory reactions and not one specific disorder. So anaphylactic shock means that there's a very acute medical emergency that affects your whole body and it involves very strong allergy-like reactions. Let's look at how a typical anaphylactic shock plays out. In the most common case, the patient first has contact with an antigen, so something that the person is allergic to. Okay, so let's say that there's a patient and without knowing it, she has a lidocaine allergy. Now she's at the dentist and she gets a lidocaine injection. Symptoms can start from anywhere within a few seconds to a few hours, but normally they will get going within a few minutes. It also kind of depends on whether it's an injection or whether it's ingested or whether it's been an insect sting. An injection uh, involves the quickest response while food involves the slowest response. Normally the skin shows very sudden reactions. There's itching, burning, raised hives, swelling, swollen tongue, swollen lips. Also very common is that there's a fast asthma-like response. So the patient wheezes and has a hard time breathing. The patient might also be coughing, the larynx might be swollen, blood oxygen could be really low too. These two kind of symptoms, skin and respiratory, are the most frequent in anaphylaxis. Some patients also have GI symptoms and they can persist for several hours, like abdominal pain, diarrhea and vomiting. Quite often there's also cardiovascular symptoms, low blood pressure, collapse, uneven heartbeat, even infarction and cardiac arrest. So the cardiovascular response is what makes it an anaphylactic shock. The Jenner syndrome is called anaphylaxis and severe forms of it also involve these circulatory shock symptoms. Now, not all of these symptoms need to be present. As said, anaphylaxis is a set of symptoms that can have different triggers and pathways involved. The clinical diagnosis is aimed at finding out if the patient should be treated with epinephrine, which counteracts the inflammatory response. The commonly accepted diagnosis depends on the patient's history. Did she have contact with something that has triggered anaphylaxis in her before? or with something that is a frequent trigger in other patients, like peanuts, shellfish or penicillin. You will have to ask the patient thoroughly to find out. In case the patient did have contact with a known trigger for her, say she took penicillin even though she's had allergic reactions to it before, then the only additional symptom is low blood pressure. We would already diagnose anaphylaxis in that case. In the second case, the patient only had contact with something that could well be a trigger, but that she doesn't have a history with yet. Say, she took penicillin, but never had allergic problems with it, or it's the first time she's taking it. In that case, we'll diagnose anaphylaxis if at least two out of the four categories are present. Finally, even if it seems that the patient didn't have any contact with any known or potential trigger, if she has skin symptoms like hives or mucus secretion, and low blood pressure or she's collapsing, then we would still diagnose anaphylaxis. 
Now, of course, these rules are not set in stone, and they are more of rules of thumb. But they do a pretty good job, clinically, in picking out those patients who do have a severe allergic reaction and who could go into shock. So those are the patients that we do want to treat with epinephrine. If the diagnosis is anaphylaxis, then the treatment needs to start at once, because it could progress into a severe shock. Just to underline that, in the cases where the patient goes into cardiac arrest eventually, this happens generally after like 30 minutes for food, but just after 15 minutes for insect stings and even just 5 minutes after drug administration. So you really need to be quick. The first step is to remove the allergen if it's still around. So if it's an insect sting and the sting is still in, it has to come out. Then the treatment's main component is one or several epinephrine injections. Epinephrine is the main player in the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, and it's useful in anaphylaxis because it constricts blood vessels and relaxes the bronchi and bronchioles. So on the one hand, it leads to vasoconstriction, which is essential in getting blood back into circulation, which is the shock problem. On the other hand, it causes bronchodilation, and that helps with the airway constriction and the difficulty breathing. If it's given on time, it can prevent or reverse the shock reaction. Everything else is really aimed at stabilizing the patient and managing the shock. So placing her on the bag with the feet up and closely monitoring her for circulation, for airway constriction, for example, from vomiting, breathing overall and mental status. If the patient does go into shock, it might be necessary to give supplemental oxygen via mask, intubation or even tracheostomy if necessary. Injecting a large amount of saline solution can also help with the shock by increasing the fluid volume that is in circulation. And if the heart stops, of course, you'll have to perform CPR. Actually, most patients, though, who do receive epinephrine on time recover well. It's very important to monitor the patient closely, even after she has recovered, because there's a sizable percentage of cases where the first anaphylactic episode is followed by a second one a few hours later, and that's called biphasic anaphylaxis. Some estimates say that it's as much as 20% of cases, but the number is a bit uncertain. Patients who have recovered from anaphylaxis, but who don't know what caused the episode, might want to get an allergy or a serum test to find out, because the most important strategy in not getting another anaphylactic episode, of course, is to avoid exposure to the allergy. Patients who are at risk of being exposed again also might get a prescription of an epinephrine auto-injector, so something which they can use to inject themselves in the case that it's necessary, or maybe their family members or friends can do it if they are no longer able to. So what does commonly trigger anaphylaxis? Well, it can be pretty much anything that a person can be severely allergic to. So the big groups are food, venoms and medications. Examples for food allergies can be peanuts, shellfish, milk or egg or anything else. Insect stings could come from yellow jackets, paper wasps, fire ants or honeybees, for example. Allergic reactions to drugs might involve beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin or non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, like aspirin or ibuprofen, opioids like morphine or heroin, or also radio contrast media. Some of the most serious anaphylactic shocks can actually occur in a medical setting, like during a surgery. That's because injecting allergens gives the fastest response. As said, there are several drugs that can cause anaphylactic reactions. And then there are other allergenes like animal dander, pollen, hormones, but also latex rubber, exercise, extreme temperatures, or alcohol. Some of them are clearly non-allergenes, but they can still cause this allergy-like reaction. And a surprising amount of anaphylactic shocks cannot be pinpointed to any trigger at all. This happens especially often in adults, and it's called idiopathic shocks. Generally, children are at a higher risk than adults, and females at a higher risk than males, and that's due to estrogen. Asthma patients are also more likely to develop anaphylaxis. Finally, a quick word on how frequent anaphylaxis is in the population. Around 2% of people report that they have at least one anaphylactic episode in their life that makes them go to hospital. The number of hospitalizations is on the rise. In summary, anaphylactic shock is an acute systemic allergic reaction that can be very dangerous, but it is well preventable and well treatable if it's detected on time.